I've I've been seeing you all over the place. Have you, Bishop? Yeah, yeah. since uh-huh. we since we last saw you, I saw you on Ben Shapiro. Oh and, yeah, and Ruben and Jordan Pierce. Yeah. yeah, and you're on uh, mainstream. I think news channels are well, are having you. Was this big break, you know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we try we try to take credit for that. <laughs> the mind pump bump. Yeah, that's what we call that. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, things growing or things is what you're doing seems to be working. Yeah, I mean, we're on fire is going great guns and, you know, a lot of different fronts. So we still do the YouTube videos, we do podcasts, uh, the long films, you know, so we just got back a few months ago from Europe. I was filming over there. So we, we're kind of moving on a lot of different fronts. But but one of the things we're focusing on is that kind of going out to the wider culture thing and especially addressing audiences that wouldn't normally, you know, maybe come to the Catholic Church or to religion so that's why someone like Peterson, you know, I've always found intriguing. And he's speaking to a lot of people about, I would call them religious themes, you know, and I'm not in a way that I would consider, you know, just right in every detail, but he's opening a lot of doors for people. So I was happy to dialogue with him, you know, talking to you guys. I mean, that's part of that strategy, too, is to kind of go outside of the walls of the church. That's a big part of our work. Mm-hmm. The last time that we met, we were we were actually talking about Jordan Peterson. That was a big yeah. topic, and you hadn't got linked up with him. We obviously have listened to that. I think we've listened to that interview multiple times because uh, we we like a lot of the stuff that he talks about. We love what you're talking about. What was that experience like for you? What did you What did you it's think? Good. Yeah, we did kind of a Skype thing, you know. So I was yeah. just in my uh, house, and then he was on Skype. So it was kind of really informal. But we talked for a long time, like an hour and a half, maybe long yeah. conversation, covering a lot of different topics. Uh, you know, he's an intriguing guy, and we have a similar background in some ways. We've read a lot of the same people. He's got a philosophical interest as well as uh, psychology, and the mind is sort of philosophy and religion. So there's a lot of overlap in our interests, and I think our approach is similar in in some ways. Yeah. So we had a lot to talk about, and uh, he was very, uh, you know. Uh, very moved, obviously, by religious themes. Whenever that would come up, you could tell he was Got very emotional. affected. Mm-hmm. Right. And that, I, at the time, surprised me a little bit, you know, but I thought, good, you know, if uh, he's really being affected personally by it, it's not just a matter of ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I enjoyed it a lot. It was a real pleasant conversation. It was easy going. It wasn't in any way confrontational, you know. Uh, it was our first chance, really, to, to meet. Yeah. So I was delighted with it, you mm-hmm. know. From our standpoint, you know, we're we're obviously in the health space, and, yeah. And you know, our journey through health and fitness took took us through exercise and then nutrition, and then eventually you realize relationships around you contribute to health, and then eventually, I think you start to realize that there's a spiritual component uh, to health as well. And you actually see this quite a bit in the fitness space, but just not in the form of what you would consider traditional religion. So you see a lot of people yeah. in health and fitness that are like you know, crystals and they talk about the universe and, and stuff like that. And I think yeah. that they're acknowledging that, that, that there's a spiritual component right. to health. Everyone's hungry for God. That's the first thing, you know, so it's always going to come up in some form. Even those who say, oh, I have no time for God. I'm an atheist. I'm agnostic. They're not really. Fundamentally, everybody is hungry for God. I don't know if last time around I shared this line with you, but whenever this issue of like body and soul comes up, I always think of Thomas Aquinas, who's my intellectual hero. And Thomas said, the soul is in the body, not as contained by it, but as containing it. And see, that is right mm-hmm. to that point. The soul is not like hidden in there someplace. Or boy, I got to get my soul out of this lousy body so I can it can really get spiritualized. The, the soul is in the body, not as contained by it, but as containing it. The soul is kind of, a, it's a greater reality. It includes the body, so to speak. And so, you know, in a biblical vision, which the Catholic Church hangs on to, the body is extremely important. It's not like body versus soul. Mm. That's a platonic or a Gnostic game of let's get the soul out of the body or let's denigrate the body. You know, if you pay attention to the body, that's a bad move. That's just not biblical. It's not Catholicism, certainly. Mm. So I think, it, to me, it makes perfect sense that that uh, an interest in, in bodily health naturally leads to the issue of, of health of soul or spiritual health. One of the most ancient terms for a priest is... Um, is the one who does kura animarum, right? He cares for the soul. Just you know, we doctors care for the body, psychologists care for the mind. Well, who cares for the soul? But when you care for the soul, you're also caring for the mind and for the body because the soul is what contains all of it. You know, so my years like doing seminary formation, I was just training people who were into soul training, soul uh, doctoring. 
and uh, so all those things are connected. Absolutely. Mm. So I so I could I could pretty clearly list the symptoms of what you would find with a poor diet. Yep. Or the symptoms of yep inactivity or poor activity or inappropriate activity or the or even the symptoms of poor relationships. What would the symptoms be of uh, poor spiritual, spiritual health. health or a sin, lack of training there? Sin, self reproach, sadness. Uh, depression, aridity, the spiritual masters call it, you know, dryness. But, you know, the best term actually would be sin. When sin manifests itself, so in particular sins that we commit, that's a sign of a deeper dysfunction. So Paul talks about like being in sin, when sin has taken control of me. That means you've got a much more fundamental issue going on, and it's manifesting itself in the particular sins. So do the physical... Analogy, you got symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. Symptoms are manifesting themselves. A doctor will say, okay, those are coming from a deeper dysfunction. Or like in, in the case of you know physical fitness, we're like lethargy or I'm getting fat or whatever it is. You say, well, that's all coming from a more fundamental right. trouble here with diet and exercise or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what a soul doctor is attuned to. What are the sins in this person's life? And then what's the sin that they're coming from? And you can always trace it, by the way, look at all the spiritual masters, back to one fundamental problem. You know, uh, Sin, with a capital S, is always making an idol out of the ego. So that's always the fundamental mm. form of sin. It'll manifest itself then in, in a million different sins. And, you know, a mistake, actually, that some beginner spiritual directors make is they can focus too much on sins. So I'm just looking at your sins and how do I address the sins going on? Mm -hmm. No, but what are those sins symptomatic of? Oh, wow. That makes deeper a lot of sense. Sin. And that's what we have to get at. This reminds me of like someone coming to me and saying, hey, um, you know, I got to uh, gotta lose 30 pounds so I can get happy. And then I realized, right. well, actually, you got to get happy first. And that's how you lose uh, the, the 30 pounds. And yeah. when you're, you're, you're mentioning the sins as these symptoms, when you're saying it initially, I'm thinking like sins, like having sex before marriage or, you know, yeah. using God's name in vain. But I think when you said, I use. Uh, creating an idol out of the ego. Explain that a little bit. That's the ego drama versus the theodrama. That's when you say my life is about realizing my plans, my projects. Uh, you're my bit uh, players. You're my, you're my supporting cast. I'm, I'm the center of the universe. Mm. My life's about me. I'm the writer, producer, and director, and star of this great drama. And all of you are kind of bit players in it. So right now, you know, the, the Robert Barron show's on the road here, and you guys mm. are, I'm going to move on. That, the ego drama, right, making the ego central, then produces all the dysfunction that we associate with sin. Um, the key is making a transition to the theodrama, which is saying there, there's a great drama that God is producing and God is directing and God wants you to play a role in it. But when you discover that role, then you found who you really are. But it's not about you. Your life isn't about you. It's about what God wants for you. And when you make that transition, then things tend to fall into place in your life. That's when you get healthy spiritually. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So that's one of the major ways to name the difference. Are you ego dramatic or theodramatic in the way you look at your life? How would that look in, in, in terms of how I would live? Like, let's say I wake up in the morning and it's not just about yeah. me and my ego, but it's this theo. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm kind of a morning person. I wake up early and I do... Um, um, my holy hour, they we call it, the first thing in the morning. So I go to my chapel, the Blessed Sacrament, and I pray the office, uh, you know, which is part of my obligation as a priest. You pray this series of prayers and psalms and stuff. But you also spend time, I spend time with the rosary or the Jesus prayer or just in silent contemplation, right? Well, one of the questions I always kind of force myself to ask during the holy hour is, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do today? So you can begin your day by saying, okay, how can I become more famous, get more pleasure, find more power, and, and be more uh, honored, right? I can, I can structure my day that way. That's what I want to do. Now, how will I do that? Or you can say, no, Lord, what, what do you want me to do today? What's your plan for me? How can I speak your word today? Tell me, show me. And uh, part of it is a surrender of control, you know, because the ego dramatic thing is it's I'm in control. It's my life. It's my mind. It's my will, my desires, my projects. The theodrama is, is allowing God to operate through me, you know? Uh, and see, and it never involves the negation of the self. It always involves the elevation of the self in the good way. It mm. involves making you more yourself because when you surrender your mind and your will and your powers and your energy to God, 
Now it's like the like the burning bush. It becomes more more beautiful and more radiant, you know, without being consumed. That's the symbolism of the burning bush. It's on fire but not consumed. So it's more itself. It's more beautifully itself because God is has set it on fire. Uh, that's the that's the fulcrum on which this thing teeter totters in some ways. Are you more ego dramatic or theo dramatic? It, what you're saying makes uh, so much sense, and when I hear you talk, I often wonder wh- how and why religion um, has fallen so out of favor, especially yes. with the younger generation. Yes, and you know why, I think, I'm glad you brought that up, because we've forgotten our own language of soul doctoring. Um, prior to the modern period, so let's say the rise of the sciences, prior to that, the smartest people in the West all went into soul doctoring. So think of, of the greatest minds, you know, in the ancient world and into the medieval world. Think of your Dantes and Thomas Aquinas and Anselms and Abelards and Bonaventures and all these people, right? What did they go into? They went into soul doctoring. They went into understanding the soul, what it, what it wants, what it desires, where it goes wrong, how to address it, how to salve it. And I use that word on purpose, S-A-L-V-E, because that's related to the Latin word salus. It means health, right? And uh, you'd say salve to someone in the ancient world. That meant health to you, salve. You know, that means like a greeting. Salve, S-A-L-V-E, is salve, like a salve to make you healthy. Mm -hmm. All these people studied the salves of the tradition (laughs) that you would rub into the sin-sick soul to make it uh, functional again. But see, we forgot a lot of that. Religion devolved, there's all kinds of reasons for this, into a lot of bickering about uh, science and religion, that kind of stuff, and, and questions like that. Uh, But the fundamental questions are always soul doctoring questions. They remain just as relevant today as ever because people suffer from the same things they always have. And the solutions can't be found finally in the physical or in the psychological realm. They got to be found in the spiritual realm. But we've we've stopped propagating that. We've stopped talking about it. Uh, Many of even religious leaders have forgotten that language. And I think that's exactly why, one of the reasons why religion has sort of fallen away. It just seems like, oh, it's old-fashioned science. It's outmoded, you know, cosmology or something. It's soul doctoring, and that remains as relevant as ever. This, this rem- We just recently had an interview with uh, Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you know who that is. He's an author of uh, Ego is the Enemy, Stillness is Key. And he's a, uh, a big uh, stoic reader. And mm-hmm. something he said to me that I didn't know that, Uh, And he referred to one of the Stoics, and I don't remember the Stoics' name, that was born at the same time Jesus was. What is your thoughts on Stoicism, and where does that fall into all this? Well, it was used to some degree by Christian thinkers, so it was was appropriated to some degree. And and even the language of of detachment that you find in a lot of the Christian spiritual masters has a Stoic overtone, meaning that kind of, you know, letting go and letting be, and it's, I'm I'm not going to try to control things. Here's the main difference, though. In a Stoic view, it's more like fate. There's like this sort of the forces of fate to which I surrender myself. But see, in the Bible, it's not that. I mean, God isn't as bland as that. God's a person. God's an actor. God wants something. God is involved in our lives. So yes, we got to get detached from our egotistic desires. So wealth, pleasure, power, honor, right? And all the things that are they're in, into that. So my whole life becomes my attachments to these four things. Get rid of that. That's true. Become detached. So that, not like fate can take over or some abstract, you know, necessity, but that God can take over. And boy, that you're, now you're in for a ride, man, because God is, is active and he's a person and he wants to accomplish something. So that's very different from Stoicism, which is... You know, in a way, to the, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but there's something like that in, in the Buddhist tradition. There's a lot that we find, a lot of congruence with that kind of detachment and acceptance and all that. But the difference is you don't have that that vibrant, active sense of God as a person mm. who now is is sending you on mission. That's key to Christian spirituality is it's always a mission spirituality. You've got a job to do. Because no one in the Bible, there's no exception to this, no one in the Bible ever confronts God without being sent on a mission. Mm. You know, so it's never like, uh, oh, I'm I, I'm now in my contemplative aloneness with God. Bible's not interested in that. The, the Bible says, uh, like the burning bush is a good example, you know. So Moses, Moses, come over here, <laughs> and uh, and Moses communes with God, and God reveals His sacred name. You know, I am who I am, and all this high mysticism. But then, all right, Moses, I got a job for you. Now you go liberate my people. It's true of every single person in the Bible. Period. 
And in Christian spirituality, that's true of all of us. It's finding your mission. Mm. When you find your mission, you found yourself. You don't know who you are until you found your mission. Uh, now, the, the concept of the, the Holy Trinity is a very sort of a complex uh, topic in general. Is there a way that you can sort of more clearly define that for people and have them understand like the definition of God and why this is a, a Trinity? Yeah, no, super important. Um, the Trinity is the technically theological way of stating that God is love, if that makes sense. So that's, that's the distinctive claim of the New Testament. Not that God has love or that God loves. All the religions will say that in some way. But Christianity says God is love, right? Well, if that's true, there has to be within the unity of God. So we're monotheists. We don't think there are many gods. There's one God. But within the one God, there's got to be a lover, a beloved, and the love that they share, mm-hmm. right? So if he is love, if like, you know, I have love, right? I, I love from time to time. So that's an attribute of mine. But if, if God is love straight through, that's all he is. There has to be from all eternity a, a lover, we call him the father, a beloved, we call the son, and the shared love, we call the Holy Spirit. Because spiritus just means breath in Latin, right? It's a pneuma in Greek. So it's the, the holy breath breathed back and forth between the father and the son from all eternity. That's what the Trinity names, see? So it's just a, you, you can't say, oh, yeah, I hold that God is love. But I think this Trinity stuff is a lot of, you know, hooey. No, it's just one way of saying, there's two ways of saying the same thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if God just loves, I don't have to opt for the Trinity. So let's say in a Jewish or Islamic framework, I can say the one God who, who loves. But in Christianity, I say God is love. So I have to hang out of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. In, uh, very interesting. Um, a couple interesting things come up when we when we talk about certain truths um, like detachment and how yeah. uh, they, they that's shared in, in multiple religions. One thing that I learned uh, through fitness is you can look at science and you can see what studies show. I can know anecdote through what I experienced with my clients, and then oftentimes I'll look at practices that span different cultures. And many times you find a lot of truths in that. For example, fasting. Uh, fasting yeah. is practiced all over the world. It has for thousands of years. There's lots of truths in that. Um, detachment seems to be a shared truth. There seem to be these shared kind of values. What uh, One common question, one even that comes up for me a lot is, how do I know that this is the right religion or this is the right belief over others? Yeah, and, and you're, two things you're raising, they're both important. First of all, the points of, of commonality. And you're right. I mean, anyone that looks at the uh, philosophical and, and spiritual, even psychological tradition, let's say it like a Peterson does, you're going to find these these points of contact for sure. And detachment is one of the great unifying elements because where we tend to go wrong is we get hung up on something creaturely, you know, I would say, something finite, all good in themselves, like wealth, pleasure, honor, power, they're all good in themselves. The, the material world's good in itself, the body's good in itself. But if I make any of those things absolute, I get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Hence, I fast. Hence, I, you know, abstain from things. Hence, I give up wealth. Sure. Hence, like in a lot of spiritual traditions, including Catholicism, you've got celibacy, you know, which has always been a sign of a certain detachment from sex and marriage and the things that we usually get, you know, preoccupied with. So, those are points of, of commonality for sure. Now, how do you know the Christian path of all these paths is the right one? See, what's hard about that question is it's a bit like asking, uh, let's say an Einsteinian. Well, how come you think Einsteinian, you know, physics is the correct path? Mm. Well, there's no, you know, one formula. You'd have to kind of walk someone through all kinds of things. I'm looking over your shoulder at a, at a picture of John Henry Newman back there, who and we just celebrated his canonization. I was just over in Rome for that. Mm-hmm. And Newman famously says, the way we come to assent to say like, yeah, that's true. It's hardly ever by means of like one clinching argument. It's hardly ever by means of one thing. It's it's this argument, this experience, this hunch, this intuition, this example, this person. You know what I'm saying? All of which tend to come together in one place. They, they, they tend to one conclusion. And that's the process by which we come to say, yes, that's true. And I think that's true of Christianity. It's a whole slew of things. And if we had time, we could sort of sure. take you step by step through that. But it, there's never like a, a, a silver bullet thing. Of like, oh, that, that proves why Christianity is true. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's one way I, I might just send, put out like a little teaser sort of answer. Name a religion or a philosophy that's more compelling than this, that God 
went to the limits of God forsakenness to find us and bring us back. Because that's Christianity, it seems to me, is the Father, you know, God so loved the world that he sent his only son, but where? So we could, you know, proclaim things from a height to us and tell us how bad we are. No, he sent his son all the way down. That's the cross, right? I mean, into into cruelty and, and into hatred and into violence and into deep suffering, into death itself. God died. Why? That he might find us and then bring us back. Now, to your earlier question about the Trinity, see, in the name of the Father, so there's the, the lover, the one that did the sending, and of the Son, and see what we do with that. We go all the way down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the Father sends the Son, mm-hmm. and then of the Holy Spirit, that means the love that connects them, is now the love that, that contains me. See, So the Father, out of love, sends the Son all the way down to get us. Th- think of people... In, in their worst moments in life, right? And we've all been there. We've all been there. When, in your time of greatest despair, when you're, you're in some addiction, you're caught, you're, you've lost a loved one, you're in deep sadness and suffering. That's what this means, right? The Father sent the Son all the way there. So when you look at a depiction of the crucified Jesus, that's what you're meant to see. Mm. That's me in, in, that, in that situation. We've all been there. But the Father sent the Son all the way there so as to gather us back into the Holy Spirit, which is the love that connects them. Um, I don't know. I've studied a lot of the religions and philosophies of the world. And just from a, a kind of aesthetic standpoint, if you want, or what what's compelling, I mean, I don't know. I don't know anyone that's more compelling than that. <laughs> you, you talk about the the four things to, to detach from. And yeah. in themselves, they can be good. Mm-hmm. How do we find that balance of pursuing maybe those things or being a part or living with amongst those things, but then also detaching at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you St. Augustine's great formula. And I've told people, if you want to be happy, this is it. Throw out all the other books. This is it. Augustine said, love God and love everything else for the sake of God. Now you'll be happy. In other words, love God with all, you know, and the Bible says, with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. That means God is it. God is the center of your life. Now, once that's in place, okay, I love God. Now, I love everything else for the sake of God. So, do I have wealth? Okay, good. Now, use it for God's purposes, not your own. Mm. Do I have a pleasure, whether it's in, it's in uh, sex or food or drink or, or the sensual pleasure? Terrific. How is that part of God's uh, desire? Do I have honor? Have I been honored? Great. What, what's sick is when I say honor, honor, honor. Oh, is that great? I, I love that. I want more of it. See, which will inevitably happen, by the way, because you will get addicted to all these things. I guarantee there's no way around it. You will get addicted if you don't have God as your anchor, right? So if I say you have fame, you've been honored, good. Use it for God's purposes, you know? Power, you've been given power. All right, terrific. And we love power. Tolkien, I think, is right about that. Maybe of, of the four, it's one we love the most is mm-hmm. power. Um, okay, good. You've been given power. Now use it for God's purposes. So love God and then love all those things for the sake of God, and you'll be okay. Hmm. But when you start loving those things for themselves, then you get off kilter, you fall apart on the inside, and then you tend to radiate unhappiness around you. Hmm. you know? I, I noticed for myself, and this is uh, it's kind of, I think, a common belief that when things tend to get hard in life, that's when I start to search for some of these answers. Mm-hmm. And do you think that life has just gotten so easy that people are less likely to search for some of these answers? No, because I think the, the search is going on all the time. I hear it all the time. Okay. What can happen is I get lulled into a kind of complacency and I think, okay, I've got enough. I've got enough to make me happy. But it never lasts because we're not wired that way. We're wired for God, right? We all are. And so I won't be happy. Trust me. <laughs> And it'll manifest itself. You always see it. Someone goes, oh, I got all the wealth I've ever wanted. I got all the pleasure. I got all the honor I've ever wanted. I'm going to sit back and relax. Good luck. It'll never stay that way. You'll want more. You'll get frustrated. You'll lose it, you know? And so um, there's a permanent hunger for God that's hidden in all that. See, behind every addiction, that's the thing that a soul doctor has to see. Behind every addiction is a quest for God. When you're saying like, okay, I'm, I'm... I'm looking for pleasure. So whether it's booze or it's pornography or it's or it's uh, drugs or whatever it is. And I find it. I find it. I got it. I got the pleasure I wanted. But what happens is, it, of course, it, it, it fades away, right? So now I go back. I want more of it. And maybe I do get more of it. But then that fades away. And then I start to panic and I, I, I start looking for more of it. 
And before you know it, you're addicted. You're addicted. But see, what's underneath that is a hunger for God. Mm-hmm. You, you want God. So that the spiritual master's got to get in there and say, here's what's really going on in these desires of yours, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, Bishop, you talked about how God is plays an active role yeah. uh, in our lives, and from what I know of uh, you know the Bible, and is that there in the in the beginning there's stories of God playing a role, and then there's Satan that plays a role. Mm-hmm. Does Satan play a role in our lives? What's the what is the the belief around that? Is that that and and if he does or how? Yeah, I think he does, and he does through temptation for the most part and spiritual insinuation. Um, there's a famous uh, fresco. It's up in Orvieto, and it's by um, um, Luca Signorelli. And it's this great image of the of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist looks for all the world like Jesus. So he's got the typical, you know, vesture and, and look of Jesus. And he's speaking to the crowd with these these two hands coming out. But you look more closely at the picture, and next to him is is the devil, and he's up to his ear, and he's just whispering something. And actually, it's the devil's hand that's coming through I've his. Seen this. His yeah. vesture, and so yeah. it's a it's a beautiful depiction of how that works. That the the dark spiritual powers uh, tend to do it through insinuation and temptation, so that it looks like, oh, I, I'm I'm acting, and you are in a way, but but it's the dark power has kind of insinuated something to you. So yeah, I do think Paul said that we battle against not just flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. So there are flesh and blood opponents that we face all the time. You know, people mm-hmm. around us and mm-hmm. and. The culture and so on. But Along, then, how, how similar is that to the concept of yin yang, like with that duality? Well, no, because that's more positive. See, the, the well, there's a couple things I'd say. The yin yang thing, I think, is a really rich and and profound principle that you've got this sort of uh, dark light, if you want, or positive negative forces that are at play, and finding the balance between them is the right thing. So that's good. There's something really right about that. But we don't want to find a balance like between Jesus and the devil. Like let's find the right balance. Right. This is more of like a, a direct affront a, a to spiritual well-being. You know, so the devil has to be rebuked. And so that's the you know, Jesus move in the Gospels is to rebuke him. You don't compromise with him. But yin yang is a different thing. That's the, and the Taoist thing I think is very rich and profound. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, Jordan Peterson plays with that I think in a very provocative way. About yeah, I've noticed that you know, what we know, and then there's the kind of the realm of the unknown, and I got to move into that realm. And, you know, so, I mean, all of that, I think, is very positive. And that's just, a, that's kind of a cool way of looking at, at your psychological development. But this would be a different game we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Can, how does, uh, can the devil possess people? And is it like you see in the movies? Or are there different ways where people get possessed with this? Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I, what I mean by that is it's such a rare phenomenon. Okay. I, I think there is that phenomenon. Really? I think okay. typically the devil moves much more subtly through insinuation and temptation. That's much more common and much more dangerous, frankly. Uh, I think possession is real. I've I've known some exorcists. I mean, people that are involved in that work directly. And um, yeah, I think it happens. But it's a very, very, very rare phenomenon. And the church would call upon formal exorcism only in extremely rare cases. Four criteria have to present themselves with utter clarity before a bishop would ever um, agree to that. So it's not like it's a common thing. You know. Have you ever witnessed one? No, oh. no. But I've known exorcists over the years who have been involved with them. You know, and and again, talk to the exorcists. They'll tell you the same thing. They'll say this is extremely rare. And so when people get they're, they get too excited about it or too interested in it, that's not a, a good thing. Um, you know, I wouldn't mess around with it. And the the series, there's people I think who, uh, I'm speaking now more broadly outside the Catholic Church, I think that 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 play around with this thing uh, in an irresponsible way. I, I wouldn't play around with it. Mm. Um, yeah, I went to church as a young kid. My, my family took me to, I think, eight or nine different denominations as, as a kid. So I kind of yeah. saw a lot. And I, we were in a Pentecostal church for a while and I saw the slain in the spirit yeah. and, you know, rebuking Satan out of people. And it, it, what I had a hard time as a kid was, I just, it seemed uh, like it was uh, almost a show that yeah. they were putting on, but it was happening every Sunday. Every Sunday right. we were <laughs> right. you know, rebuking Satan out of people and they were falling over and getting <laughs> right. slain in the spirit. And No, and I'll, I'll try to walk a careful ground here. I, mean, I have no quarrel whatsoever praying for people. And if people are in some kind of spiritual distress, psychological distress, to pray for them, I mean, that's great. But uh, I'd be extremely skeptical of that sort of, you know, as you say, you know, garden variety, like every single week we're, we're casting out the devil. And the Catholic Church is much, much more reticent and careful 
And it needs the four criteria very clearly before it ever make that formal move. You know? okay. I've heard uh, you know, spiritual leaders talk about methods and ways to be more aware of the presence of God, whether it be meditation yeah. or chanting or uh, fasting. Mm-hmm. And more recently, I've heard a lot of uh, spiritual uh, leaders or whatnot talk about using psychedelic substances, uh, you know, ayahuasca, for example, or LSD or mushrooms and how those substances can open them up and then they can see God. And what is your, your I guess, belief around those or understanding? I'd be very skeptical of the last one. The, the ones you fir- you mentioned first are, are all classical spiritual paths. And and you're right. And there are techniques, if you want to use that term, that people have used. That's trans-culturally, trans-religiously. But sure, when I go on retreat, let's say to a Benedictine monastery, and I get up early in the morning, and that's part of it too. You know, you're not, you're not lying in bed all morning. You get up early, and you join the monks in prayer, and they're, and they're chanting the Psalms back and forth, you know, in a, in a choral manner. Mm-hmm. And you join in there, and there's something um, in the repetitiveness, there's some mantra-like mm-hmm. about the reciting of the Psalms, you know. No one's trying to be um, uh, histrionic about it. You're just kind of chanting them back and forth. That's a spiritual practice, very, very ancient spiritual practice. And it does give you, you know, if you want, it's a sense of God. Now, you want to avoid any sense of automaticism. Oh, yeah, just go there, do this, and don't worry. God, you'll see God. I mean, you know, God <laughs> does what God wants. But there are classical techniques that the great spiritual traditions have seen. And you write it like about fasting and that sort of thing. Um, yes, to rid us of attachments, but see, that, that then opens a lot of things up. You know, when the, when the Lord Jesus says, you know, in regard to a, a possession, and they say, Lord, we've been praying all day, and he's, you know, some of these, it's only prayer and fasting that'll do it, you know. Uh, some of these techniques do open up certain doors, you know. Read the Desert Fathers on that and the different techniques. But what I was doing this morning, you know, in my holy hour, even like the office, what's the office? But Psalms, it's the Psalms of the ancient prayers of the church. And I'm, I don't speak them out loud, but I kind of, you know, quasi, I try to read them slowly. Well, that's a spiritual practice. Uh, I also do the Jesus prayer, which is uh, from the Eastern Christian tradition. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Repeated over and over and over again, hundreds of times. I don't do it hundreds of times, but I have the little, it's like a prayer rope. Uh, the rosary is like a mantra prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. As you're praying the rosary, you're not really attending to every single prayer individually. It's it's setting up a, a sort of spiritual and psychological space, you know? Thomas Merton said it's, uh, he used the, the Buddhist term of calming the monkey mind, you know, the mind that boop, 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 mm-hmm. jumping around. And, and like when you wake up in the middle of the night, it's always that, to me, that's where the monkey mind comes in. If you happen to wake up in the middle of the night and it's like, Oh, suddenly you're worried about 10,000 things. You're mm-hmm. like, would you shut up? Your know, <laughs> mind just won't. So the rosary has that quality to it, you know? I started uh, journaling um, yep. maybe about a, a week and a half ago, and um, I, I cannot believe the the benefit I'm receiving, yeah. for, I'm getting from journaling, just waking up in the morning and then doing that yeah. practice. And I noticed that it almost is taking the form of what you might even consider to be prayer. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, absolutely. The He's this close to praying, Bishop. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're getting them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but read Thomas Merton. I mean, Merton fills volumes of, of, um, of, of journals. And, that, and that's, that was definitely a way of praying. Merton, you know, Thomas Merton, the great Trappist mm-hmm. monk from the last century, great spiritual writer. But Merton lived as a hermit the last couple years of his life, so all by himself in this cabin out in the woods. And uh, wake up in the morning, sit out on the porch, drink his coffee, do his morning prayer. And then he would he would write, you know. And it might just be there's a bluebird sitting on the fence. And uh, he's against the uh, that pine tree. And, you know, like he's just – it's a spiritual exercise as he's describing – Observing. What, right? Yeah, observing the real, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a spiritual principle. But the, the real is always going to bring you to God. See, to be in sin is always to live in a realm of illusion to some degree. False consciousness, if you want to use that term, right? Yeah, distraction or, or false consciousness. I, I'm just I'm not in touch with the way things really are. The real is always a path to God, you know. So something as simple as that, like, can I anchor myself in the real? See what see what's right in front of me to be seen. It can be a spiritual exercise. Mm-hmm. If you know Aquinas says God's in all things by essence, presence, and power. Well, if that's true, then then God is is here, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, in, in the Jesuit tradition, they've got the, the prayer called the Consciousness Examine. You heard about that, mm. but it's 
Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, great spiritual teacher, said that if, if you eliminate all prayer but kept this one prayer, you'd, you'd probably have enough. And he meant the consciousness ex- examine. And what that is, is the end of the day, typically, to review your day, right? Like a movie. You know, okay, I woke up at 5.30 and I had a good night's sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the good night's sleep I had. And then I, I did my prayers. I had, um, I had scrambled eggs for breakfast and they were, they were good. And I went for a walk and, and how beautiful that was. I met this person. And, and I could have been kinder to that person. I, I was a bit of a jerk, you know. I'm sorry about that. Um, then I, I uh, did this. I did that. And you go through your day and you just re- review it in light of God and say, all right, what were the opportunities of grace today and how did I cooperate with them? Mm. Um, see, journaling can be part of that. You can journal your way through That's a, exactly a, what I do. a conscious exam. Yeah, like, what happened to me today? But put it in terms of God. What was God offering to me today? You know, God's, you know, in the present moment always. We get obsessed with the past and the future. That's a a typical way of living in illusion, by the way, right? I'm obsessed with my past. Oh, what I did. Oh, what a terrible person I was. Oh, my God. Or, oh, how great it was way back then. Or, oh, if only, if only this happened to me, I'd be so happy. If only, but those are both illusions, you know. Uh, God is, is, Thomas says, the ends realissimum. He's the most real being. (laughs) <laughs> so when I'm in touch with reality, what's right in front of me, I'm in touch with with mm. God, and journaling is a way to do that. And so is the conscious examine. Yeah, they call wanna, that being present in many. Yeah, I wanted right. to talk to yeah the uh, keeping on the real side of uh, you know talking about Jesus as a human being and talking about that him actually being here. Do you worry sometimes that um, you know in this postmodern world we're not going to be recognizing the fact that he was an actual real human being? No, I think it's the opposite. I mean, when I was coming of age, everyone emphasized, you know, the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was a real historical figure and, and boy, he's a human being like us. I think it's the other side that our time has, has forgotten that he's divine. Mm-hmm. And see, if he's, he's human indeed. So we say he's true God and true man, right? But if he's just another human teacher among many, okay, you know, there's the Buddha and there's Sufi mystics and there's you know, Deepak Chopra, and there's all kinds of people I can choose from. Jordan Peterson, maybe, is a mm. spiritual teacher. If that's all Jesus is, well, then, okay. Mm. I mean, who cares? What Jesus is, is the, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son all the way to the limits of God forsakenness that I might be drawn back into the divine life. Now we're talking. Now, see, for that to be true, he does have to be both divine and human. Mm-hmm. If he's just divine, he's not going to reach all the way down into my experience, right? Not if he's right, if he's just human though, he's not going to save me. <laughs> it's like, you know, he's in the same boat I am. He's as lost as I am. So, what makes him the savior is that he's both divine and human, which is the great Christian claim. And you know, go historically, this thing oscillates back and forth. You go over the centuries. Sometimes the humanity of Jesus is really emphasized. Other times the divinity is really emphasized. And mm-hmm. the church has always said both and, both and, and. and if anything, I'd say in my lifetime, it was certainly the humanity of Jesus that was emphasized. Mm-hmm. And the divinity was kind of like, oh, well, who knows? But it's the two of them together that makes him the Savior. Hmm. What really attracted me to you initially, uh, Bishop, uh, when I saw you on YouTube was your uh, ability to communicate um, the way you communicate things. Um, it, you you were you're able to pierce through the cynicism um, that I think is so common. The one the cynicism this, you know, that that can sometimes overpower me, and so yeah. I see a lot of times with what you're doing with social media and your and your your new media, your podcasts and whatnot, is you have a lot of non Catholics, non Christians who are moving over, listening to what you have to say, and saying, "Oh, this is really good." But I also see you getting a lot of criticism from Catholics and Christians. It seems like they seem to be the ones that have issues with. Maybe the way you're reaching out or how you communicate is that is that what's happening? Am I just well? I mean, some on the extremes. I mean, honestly, some on the extremes, both left and right. But mm. uh, some on the right are mad because I suggest that we may hope that all people be saved. Now, that's not a claim that they all will be saved. I don't know. It's up mm. to God. You know, I don't know. But may we hope for it? And and I stand with a number of theologians who say yes. So some on the extreme right have gotten mad at me for that, but. And I've clarified a million times what I mean and don't mean by that you know, statement. Mm. 
So I, I don't worry about that too much. I mean, I think that whenever you come out uh, in a very public way and you talk about religion, you're going to get a lot of people sure. throwing stones at you <laughs> sure. because it's just the way it goes from from Jesus on. I mean, religion just stirs up people's mm. ultimate feelings. How know? does the church feel about what you're doing? Are they very supportive? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they haven't, uh, when you say like the church, um, you know, whether it's my bishop when I was back in Chicago, mm-hmm. Cardinal George was a big supporter of what I was doing. Out here now, I'm an auxiliary bishop in LA and, you know, Archbishop Gomez has never in any way set limits or said, oh, don't do this or that. When I go among my brother bishops, um, they're always like super enthusiastic about it. They elected me chair of the uh, evangelization committee, you know, for the USCCB, the Conference of Catholic Bishops. So, no, I think that, you know, the church, whatever you mean by that, but has been, um, you know, hmm. supportive. When yeah. you when you are teaching, what do you what do you find the the hardest book of the Bible uh, to teach and explain to people? Or which book do you think they have the hardest time receiving? Probably Genesis, the, the opening of Genesis, because that's where people get hung up. You know, um, it's, it's one of the great texts that's come down to us from uh, human history, the book of Genesis. But people get hung up on the opening chapters as though it's proposing an alternative scientific vision. Hmm. And I got to decide, you know, do I side with the scientists and the earth is 13 and a half billion years old or I side with the book of Genesis and it's whatever people say 6,000 years old or, you know, I got it's Darwin or it's the the opening of Genesis. So in a way, that's a problem. I mean, you're you're up against a a fundamental misunderstanding of how that text functions. So to that point… Can can we believe in creation and evolution, or is there a line? Between? No, absolutely, you, you can and should because they're it's apples and oranges. The problem is people think they're they're addressing the same issue. Evolution is a theory that it, that uh, purports to describe how uh, biological species have evolved over space and time. It's proposed by Charles Darwin, refined by a lot of his uh, uh, disciples over the last you know century and a half. Yeah, good. I find it to be, I learned it as a kid and found it persuasive then, find it persuasive now. Can you raise you know questions about it? Sure. Serious people do. Um, fine. That's a scientific issue. If you ask me how the how did the species develop, I, I'm not going to look to the Bible. I'm going to look uh, ask scientists. They, they can articulate uh, the answer to that question. The Bible is asking and answering entirely different questions, you know. Uh, is it about the origin of all things? Yeah, in a way, but it's proposing it theologically rather than scientifically. Mm. Are all things created by God? Yes, is the great claim of Genesis. And that's dead right, but that's a religious claim, not a scientific uh, claim. It's not trying to give an account, say, the way, let's say, a, an astrophysicist might or an or a evolutionary biologist might. The Bible's making the, the point uh, in answer to a different type of question. Uh, creation... I'll do Thomas Aquinas with you. Creation names the relationship that obtains between absolute being and finite being, if I can put it that way. Aquinas says that creation is happening now. And that's that's the way into this question. Don't, don't go back, way, way back. Creation is happening now. Namely, God, absolute being, is giving rise to finite being and sustaining it in existence. God is the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? See, that, that's a different order question than how did the species develop? That's an intramundane question. That's a question about how these things in this world unfolded. But why is there something rather than nothing? Now, that's a, that's a different question. The biblical answer and the great uh, uh, traditional Christian answer is, well, God. God makes and sustains the world in its entirety. So, there, there are different questions types of questions is apples and oranges mm. speaking of science there's this uh show on netflix um uh, where they're showing these uh, backyard scientists using something called crispr technology oh, yeah, let's talk about this. to edit uh genes and whatnot do you see any problems and potential future with that kind of technology from a theological standpoint where we can you know edit our genes and make ourselves uh, you know genetically perfect enhanced. or enhanced yeah, I, I wouldn't know enough about it really to say a lot. It's first I've heard that term. Uh, I wouldn't be crazy about doing that. I think there's some. There's a very important spiritual move when you say, um, you know, let God be God and let God offer to me what God wants to offer to me. If I try to take control of life in too aggressive a way, trouble tends to follow. And, and that goes back to the beginnings of modernity. A lot of the critics of the early modern thinkers were worried about that, that I'm going to try to manipulate and control the whole of life. And boy, I, I'd be very wary, especially of that, like trying to create Superman or something and mm-hmm. eliminate anything that's that I, I deem imperfect. 
hand that over to uh, human beings with all their sin? I don't know. Yeah. I'd be very wary of that. Yeah, we we often get the question like, uh, how would we feel if they invented like an exercise in a pill or whatever? And mm-hmm. as guys who've exercised and worked through nutrition for you know decades, yeah. uh, I know. Yeah, you'll you'll take this pill and you'll get fit and lean and yeah, but you're not going to get the same benefits right. that right. you get Didn't through going through the too. journey yeah. of getting well, to that point. I'll just I'll be blunt about something. So it's not quite what you're talking about, but in so many of the Western countries. Um, down syndrome babies are simply aborted. Mm. That's why they've, they've almost disappeared in our culture. Uh, that to me is a morally horrific uh, state of affairs. But people saying, oh, that baby is not going to be up to my level. That baby is not what I want. You know, uh, That's a terrible spiritual stance to, uh, to uh, assume and a terrible thing to do on that basis. You know, So I'm very wary of, I, I'm going to create the perfect child, or I, I'm going to eliminate any children that I think are, are inadequate. Heck, go right back to the ancient world when, if a baby was born and was less than perfect, expose it on the hillside. Or the Nazis. I mean, to me, it's redolent of, of that sort of move. And uh, I'd rather let God be God and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, accept what God gives me as a gift. Um, but there's a lot of technologists really worried about artificial intelligence and how we're all going to deal with this and, you know, the moral implications. And I just would love to hear from a bishop how you guys are thinking about these types of issues. Yeah. And I, I, I hesitate because I really haven't thought about it that carefully. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I get the the danger and the difficulty of it, but I, I'm just reluctant because I haven't really looked into it or thought about it that, that much. Mm-hmm, the sure. AI issues and all <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, I, I I appreciate these conversations, and uh, these are questions that often uh, you know pop up, and it's 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 yeah. good to hear from the opinion from somebody who you know you know like yourself. So yeah, looking looking now at the world now, um, it, so this was very interesting for me years ago, uh, even when I was atheist. Um, one thing that I found fascinating is I I used to have a, a I still have a very deep passion for economics and hmm. government. And I remember learning how, you know, modern Western societies came about, you know, when it came to like the concept of liberty and free markets and how a lot of that came from the belief that we were created in God's image and we were gifted these inalienable rights. What is the connection between Christianity and freedom or is there one? Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, There's a lot we could say about that. But I I think you're right in suggesting that any polity based upon the idea of – of human rights is tied, I would say, to a religious vision, whether you know it or not. And Jefferson, of course, says it explicitly. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You go back to society, like in ancient societies, uh, when people didn't believe in, in rights, rights were the gift of uh, the government or the gift of the uh, aristocratic monarch, yeah. elite or the monarch, right? Um, it's a biblical idea that every single individual uh, made in the image and likeness of God, is therefore a subject of infinite worth and is in possession of rights that aren't the gift of the culture or the society or the king or anybody else, but of God. And therefore, governments are instituted, I'll go back to Jefferson again, to secure these rights. It's a very interesting move, isn't it, that he mm. makes there, to secure these rights, not to create them, not to ground them, not to, to um, uh, invent them, but to secure them because they're independent of the government. They come from God. The government is there to secure them, make sure that, yeah, people have, have the rights to life, liberty, and so on. So I'm very wary of, um, of non-believing polities because I think even with all their highfalutin rhetoric about, you know, the people or the workers or whatever it is, um, take God out of the picture, human rights will follow very uh, quickly. The other one, of course, is equality, which I think is very interesting. Uh, again, Jefferson, that all men are created equal and and we might just let that run through our minds you know but without notice without noticing that word go back to classical societies like go plato and aristotle and cicero equal i mean they never thought people were equal in fact it was the radical inequality that was the ground for their political philosophy so plato's got the three levels of you know types of people and only when they're in their right relationship is do you have justice Aristotle felt that a tiny handful belonged in the in public life. The rest were consigned to private life, and they should be they should do what they're told. Where the idea come from that all people are equal? I mean, to Aristotle, would, he said, "What do you mean all people are equal? Are you out of your mind?" It's a Plato. radical idea, totally. Yeah. And it's 
I would say, and it's reflected in Jefferson, is from the Bible. It's the idea that we are all, despite our differences, right, in, in intelligence and in courage and virtue and beauty, and we're different in every way. We're not equal at all. But we are equal as children of God. And, and that becomes, I'd say, the foundation for a lot of the modern democracy. So take equality and rights. You take God out of the equation. And, and you've seen it, by the way. I mean, look at the 20th century, when in these monstrous ideologies of the 20th century, when God was taken out of the equation. That's exactly what happened. It was actually, it was, it was actually part of their policy. Absolutely. Was to eliminate God. Absolutely. Karl Marx, whom I read very carefully when I was a, a student in college. I did my master's work in Marx. And uh, yeah, the first critique, Marx says, is the religious critique. So the first move you got to make is get rid of religion. And then you can move into the economic and political critiques. Um, yeah, there's good reason for that. I was blown away to learn about um, – I, I was watching some documentaries. Again, this is a passion of mine to learn of uh, – I think it was Pope John Paul's role and potential role in the fall oh, yeah. of the uh, you know the Iron Curtain of the, of the Soviet Union. It was a, a, he did a talk, and I, I don't know what country it was in. And it, was under, it, was in it was a Soviet country. 1979, June in Poland. Yes. When he uh, went back home. <laughs> of course he just, ran, no, yeah. just randomly yeah. have that, <laughs> that, that date and location. It's, it's a famous, <laughs> he had just been elected Pope, you know, and this is when um, they were threatening martial law, when uh, they thought the Soviet Union would move in and, and take over Poland militarily. And John Paul goes home and this is, you know, the church was under tremendous uh, repression but people came out by the millions. And despite, there's a wonderful literature around that because there was an extraordinary campaign of misinformation and roadblocks and all this to kind of keep people from getting where he was. Mm -hmm. But they came in the millions, you know. And the famous speech was during mass uh, in, in this, it's called Victory Square in Warsaw. And I had the privilege of filming there a couple of years ago in this huge public square. And John Paul is preaching, right? And in the sermon, he's taught, he's got the whole government behind him. He's got the the... Polish oh. communist government behind him. I mean, the the, the bravery. He yeah. could have easily been taken in. Absolutely. And uh, it's only because he was Pope that they, they didn't dare go after him, you know. But he begins talking about, about God, about human rights, about liberty, all the things we've just been talking about and how they're grounded in, in the scripture and in the great tradition. And then famously, it's the people, the crowd begins to chant, we want God, we want God. And it went on for like 15 minutes. So a million people chanting, we want God. And... Most observers say that was the beginning of the end of, mm. of the Soviet Empire, because it was just this. It was a revolution of the spirit. I mean, not mm. one shot was fired, but it was clear that they, they lost the people. They did not have the people, mm. you know. Yeah. And John Paul uh, knew how to do that. He knew how to awaken that in people, you know. And I think, yeah, that was the beginning of the end. Mm. I, I read stories about how uh, Christians are being uh, persecuted in places like China. Um, which is obviously a, a communist country. Mm -hmm. What's the role of, uh, of, of the church in, in maybe securing the freedom of, of people around the world? Well, first of all, uh, you're right in saying that uh, the most persecuted religion around the world is Christianity. No question. Not about a it. popular thing to say, but statistically no, but it's true. true. And yeah. there's no one even close in terms of second. We're, we're the most persecuted religion in the world. And that goes to the Middle East, it's in Asia, it's in Africa. In our country, it's more subtle. It's more of a cultural persecution, you know. But, but it's a it's a fiery, hot persecution in, in many other parts of the world. And yeah, the church has to witness very strongly against that and speak up and speak in favor of. And there are a lot of martyrs. I mean, the martyrs uh, have always been, as Tertullian said, the seed of Christianity. I mean, it's always the blood of the martyrs that gives rise to the church. And there are martyrs galore all around the world, including in China. And so it's a it's a tough moment, no question about it. It's a very tough moment for the church. The 20th century had more Christian martyrs than any century combined. Oh, wow. than, than, I mean, than all the other centuries combined. So wow. you think of the you know the early church. That's when they were thrown to the lions. It's nothing compared to the 20th century. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, but and look it, at you know from Hitler and Stalin and Mao and I mean the people that were they were putting Christians to death like mad in the 20th century. Mm. Why do you think that is? <sighs> well, it's a complicated thing. I would say. My basic answer is tyrannies will always recognize uh, religion as the fundamental problem. Their first move is always to eliminate religion. Again, Marx said that. That's the first critique you have to do. You can't worship anything above the government. Right. The and so when you, when you speak of the government, be, as, as we say, being under God, right? one nation under God, um, that's a threat to tyranny. It always has been. 
Mm. This is why even even back when I was atheist, I understood this and why yeah. I, as an atheist, but also as somebody who loved freedom and understood and loved the concept of liberty, I was always so opposed to people who uh, were so anti-religion because I knew, you know, I, I had read Carl Jung and I'd understood that you eliminate God and you're going to worship something and yep. usually it's the state. Yes. And that goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. That's exactly right. Uh Nature pours a vacuum, and you kick God out of the central place. Something will move into that place. Mm -hmm. And see, soul doctors have always known when that happens, trouble will inevitably come. Because you'll start worshiping. You're right. It's either wealth, pleasure, power, honor, one of those things. I begin worshiping my own ego. I begin worshiping my career. I begin worshiping my culture. begin worshiping a political figure. Someone or something will move into that place. Religion is always there to say no to that. To say no to that idolatry. Yes. That's why, you know, it's very, go back to the cross again, because um, Paul says, I, I, I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified, right? So Paul, that's his message, is the cross of Jesus and how weird that was. How weird, weird. We look at the cross and say, oh, what a charming religious symbol, you know. But I mean, the, what Paul was writing, the cross terrified people. It was, it was Roman power. It was the power of the tyrannical Roman state. And so Paul's saying, no, no I'm not afraid of it. I'm going to hold that up. Because that's a, a taunt to all of you, because God's power is greater than the power of, of the state, mm-hmm. greater than the power of Caesar. That's why the cross has always been a deeply subversive message. And tyrants have always trembled at the cross and, and what it means. So, you, of course, they'll, in league with their academic um, lackeys, they'll try to debunk the cross and say, oh, well, it's just, you know, Jesus never existed, or, you know, the poor thing just died on the cross, and that was the end of it. Or the cross is an archetypal symbol, or you know, you'll do whatever you can to to debunk the cross. But the Christian churches have always held it up because it's judgment on on tyranny. Mm. That's one of its functions, you know. It mm. judges the the uh, tyrants. Mm. People, let's say somebody's listening right now and they're they're thinking, "Gosh, you know, I want to kind of look into this a little more." I'm a little. Where do people start? Uh, let's say someone's listening and saying, you know, there may be some value to religion. Maybe it's different than what I thought yeah. it originally was. What are some good ways for people to to move into that space for themselves? I was just uh, in England, you know, uh, for this talk on Newman. And while I was there, I visited the tomb of uh, C.S. Lewis, who's mm-hmm. a great hero of mine. Yeah. And Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, I think is still a great way in. It's a great uh, opening of a door. It's based on, on talks he gave, you know, for the BBC during the war. So they were like little 15 minute talks designed for, they were intelligent, but designed for a, a general audience. And uh, I still think that book is extraordinarily good. And I give it to people all the time. I recommend it. If you, you're kind of getting into it, trying to, trying to make your way, that's a great way to open the door. Mm. What, are the, what are the greatest challenges that you think are, are facing us uh, right now? Like right now, what are the things that you're kind of focusing your eyes on and saying, okay, that's what I want to. Well, I name it in different ways. One is is a secularism or an immanentism that just says this life, this world, that's all there is. It's all I care about. You know, uh, Charles Taylor is a Catholic philosopher that talks about the buffered self, and he means a self that lives kind of within this little buffered space, and it doesn't try to break out to a transcendent. One of the signs of that is what I call the culture of self invention, which is very big today. You know, people say mm-hmm. it's my life, it's my choice. I invent myself, even to the point of my own body, my own gender, it's up to me. I'll, I'll, I decide everything, you know? Mm. That's repugnant to a religious view, whereby my life isn't about me and my choices and my, you know, goals and projects. It's about what God wants to do with me and through me and for me. Those are some of the big obstacles. So call it, if you want, a materialism and immanentism. Um, another, another obstacle related is what I call scientism, which is the reduction of all knowledge to the scientific form of knowledge. So it's just an automatic self-limiting move that the real is what the sciences understand. It's always struck me as an incredibly narrow, arrogant take on life. I mean, I just think for a second, you know, scientists are based ultimately upon our senses, right? They're, they're based on empirical observation, followed by hypothesis formation, followed by experimentation, followed by conclusion. It's the you know, scientific method. Great, great. It's terrific for understanding you know, the world that I can empirically verify but think of the, these stupid eyes we have you know they're, they're attuned to one little narrow part of the light spectrum right? that's what they can take in even within in a worldly sense are, are there's are elements of the light spectrum that we we can't see with these little right. eyes and what are the odds 
that these eyes that evolved right within this uh, uh, framework of planet Earth and the way the light is configured and all that stuff produce these eyes ultimately, right? So they sure they they're ordered to this world and you know, and that's it. <laughs> that's all the reality you think is is limited to that. And that's not saying one little thing against the sciences. It's they're great, terrific, but to say to make the further philosophical move, and that's all there is. Mm-hmm. What the scientists can know and control, mm-hmm. that's all there is. I, I think it's breathtakingly arrogant uh, take, especially when you look at the great tradition, the pre-scientific tradition that would 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 say, "Are you kidding?" I mean, that had a keen sense of dimensions of reality beyond what the senses can take in. Yeah. Anyway, I, in our last podcast, I think you said there was like there's scientific truth, and then there's philosophical truth, and then yeah. there's spiritual truth. Yeah, I thought that illustrated it quite That's well. That's right. And don't uh, let them be themselves. Don't reduce one to the other. You know. And so it's nothing against the sciences. It, they're they're great, terrific, but don't draw everything else into the sciences. That's a that's scientism, yeah. and that's a real problem today with young people. I find. Circling back to when we were talking about uh, the devil and temptation. Do you do you think that as we are drawn closer to God that that increases? Yeah, yeah, that's a standard uh, perception of the spiritual tradition. Not surprising. Uh, if the devil is a, is a person with intelligence and will, now they're twisted and they're wicked, but uh, he would not be happy as someone gets closer to God. And so, see it in the lives of the saints all the time that the saints themselves often have the greatest spiritual conflicts. Mm. So yeah, that that makes sense to me. As long as you're far from God, the devil's happy. I'm right. gonna leave you alone. You're doing you're great. There. <laughs> you're doing great. I'll leave you alone. Mm. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Well, it depends. <laughs> How personal you want so, to yeah, right? Well, before we did this podcast, I thought to myself, you know, I'd like to ask some questions that I've always wanted to ask. Uh, you know, a bishop or a priest. Yeah. You know, one of them is like, do you ever? Do you ever? Th- feel sad or miss that you maybe didn't have a family or were married or have children does that ever yeah sure did yeah. you ever did you did you date anybody before moving into this yeah this space oh, years okay. ago you know <laughs> and then got on this path with some hesitations you know there were a few moments when i was uh much younger where i thought no no that's that's not the path i want but then once i i think entered the major seminary i was pretty clear and i've been on that path ever since you know mm-hmm. but yeah i mean because Life is always making choices, right? So you say A and not B, that means you're going to give something up. Yeah. Every choice is, is painful because it's a, it's a decision. It's a cutting, right? Scissoray. You decide something, you're cutting something off. Yeah. So sure, sure, yeah. you know. Does, does God want us to have lots of children? Does he want us to have families and have lots of kids? Or is it different from person to person? Well, I mean, generally speaking, it's a great biblical uh, motif, you know go forth and multiply and mm-hmm. be fruitful. And so God, yeah, I think in the Bible, tends to like a big family. It sees it as a sign of, of life and of confidence in God and a sign of the blessing of God. Now, having said that, of course, every case is, is unique and different. And I wouldn't want to, you know, hey, if you don't have a lot of kids, you're not doing God's will. I, sure. I would never want to say that. But I think generally speaking, you know, God's a God of life and He's uh, he likes that kind of fecundity and that, you know, Go forth and multiply. It's a sign of his blessing. You brought up in um, uh, Jordan's talk where you you brought up Gran Torino, and I just I oh, yeah. find that even fascinating. It's a movie that you would yeah. watch. Are you a big movie guy? Oh you- yeah, yeah. And I started when we first did the YouTube stuff. It was it was uh, Scorsese's The Departed. It was the first oh, right. YouTube I ever yeah, did. Great movie. And the movie ones have always been popular. Whenever I do a movie review, and yes, I, maybe to anticipate your question a bit. Um, I think Christians who are evangelizers can't afford to be super squeamish. Like, oh, if a movie has a swear word or, you know, uh, it's got violence in it or something. We can't be that squeamish. I think we have to enter. And look, you know, it's so many of the great works of of the literary tradition. You know, go back to someone like Chaucer, uh, Dante, it's a Shakespeare. I mean, they're full of bawdiness and violence. And, you know, so <laughs> uh, I, I don't think Grand Torino is that different than some of those great uh, works. But like to your point earlier, Gran Torino is the, is the best one I know in the last 50 years of showing in dramatic form what, what salvation is like. Because it's someone that journeys into the darkest place to do two things, to expose the dark powers for what they are, to bring them out in the open, and to liberate someone who is enthralled to them, right? But he had to do it through a great act of self-sacrificing love, where he gave his life. And remember, of course, that when when 
spoiler alert and everything, when Eastwood is is shot and then he's in the attitude of the cross. Right. Well, there's Christianity. Mm-hmm. When I sat in the theater, I wasn't expecting it at all. I all I knew was this it was movie purposely uh, put in there, right? But about a guy saying "Get off my lawn." That's all I knew about that movie. <laughs> yeah. And I as I watched that, my goodness, I, I have not seen any better presentation because in the Church Fathers, that's what the cross means. It means the powers are exposed. See, that's why it's so important, that taunting thing I talked about. The, the cross brings them out. So, the, you know, Bob Dylan said, the, the enemy I see wears the cloak of decency. It's always gone that way, right? So Pontius Pilate and Caesar Augustus and mm-hmm. Quirinius, that's why the Bible mentions all those guys, mm-hmm. because they were the cloak of decency. There's all the leaders of society. The cross rips all the cloaks of, 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 of the, it rips away all that uh, conceals them, right? So it exposes them for what they are. But then it liberates. That's why the cross is freedom for Christians. It, it liberates us from the dark powers. And that's what that movie is super good at showing, you know? Mm-hmm. But it has to happen. Look how awfully it has to happen through the complete gift of one's life. There's no other way to do it. And see, the Eastwood character understands that. He understands it, it's going to cost me my life. Mm. But when the kid at the end, remember, is in the Grand Torino and he's with a big smile driving away from that life, that's the liberation that comes from the cross. Spe- right. Speaking of media, you know, when I, when I work out and I want to lift really heavy, I tend to listen to heavy metal yeah. music. <laughs> yeah. And oftentimes I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. And yeah. oftentimes you look at the, like the pictures of the covers or whatever, and it's like satanic, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and I know it's media and I don't know if it's, you know, real. Yeah. I mean, any thoughts around that kind of like, do you like heavy metal? <laughs> I like, I'm a big rock and roll fan. Not okay. so much heavy metal, but uh, what we probably call classic rock. When I was coming of age, you know, like the Beatles and the Stones yeah. and the Who yeah. and Led Zeppelin and Van Morrison. And of course, Bob Dylan's my major influence. But yeah, I love rock and roll. And, and, I like all kinds of musical forms. I was thinking the other day, I was watching the country music thing, you know, that Ken Burns did. This, he did a documentary on country music and a great segment on, on Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson. And that's how I got into country music was those two figures. Mm-hmm. And Willie Nelson, the first record I heard of his was Stardust when he did, you know, the American Classics. Remember that record from okay. a long time ago? You don't remember? I don't. <laughs> but, but Willie, in, in that wonderful voice of his and the great guitar work, plays the, the classic American songbook. Mm-hmm. Well, because I grew up with rock and roll. I didn't know those songs at all. And that led me to Frank Sinatra. I, I discovered Frank Sinatra through Willie Nelson. Oh, so anyway, I like all that kind oh, of music. Wow. But if I'm if I you really, you know, push me against the wall and say, what do you want to listen to? It would be rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> could, could that's what you, I like the most. When we, we were talking about the the money, the power, honor, those uh, is there something that you personally find you have to check yourself with the most that you yeah probably probably especially given the way my life has unfolded uh, honor you know because i'm kind of a public figure Mm. and um and now i've been honored by the church becoming a a bishop and all that and i'm kind of a public figure so i suppose that's the danger you know for someone like me um what does that feel like when you feel like you need to check it does it feel like oh this feels good yeah or maybe that that uh being highly thought of is more important than telling the truth <laughs> you know mm. it feels like that if if i'm holding back on what i think is the right thing to do or say because i'm concerned more about you know mm-hmm. uh, losing reputation or losing Backlash. status yeah. yeah so but you know everyone's got a poison somewhere he's got to name it and and uh admit it that's a, that's the importance of knowing you're a sinner which is one of the great spiritual paths mm. when you don't then you get in trouble and you you cause trouble for other people mm. too but when you know you're a sinner, then, all right, Lord, take take this, you know, and transform it. You know, I'd be bummed if I didn't ask you this. Um, I had heard from somewhere, I think it was like on a Joe Rogan podcast, this guy brought up the fact that a lot of the passages in the New Testament uh, don't really talk about Jesus's laughter. Or, <laughs> yeah. And uh, all these other characteristics in like Jesus wept and like all these other mm-hmm. emotions that yeah. he evoked, but yeah. laughter wasn't one that was represented. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll never really know. But I, I, I'll say this, though. Uh, when you read the parables and you read the, the uh, uh, great sermons of Jesus, there's no question that he uses irony and he uses um, exaggeration and he's playing with contrasts. And, you mm. know. So I, I can't help but think people were laughing as they heard some of his, and even the critiques of the Pharisees, the way he, you know, he characterizes them. So I... I I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, if people laughed with him, and I, mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine he himself wasn't laughing. Now, why they didn't put that explicitly in, 
I don't know. Yeah. You know, another way to do it, because like we have the laughing Buddha, for example. There's a whole tradition yeah. around the there's the fat Buddha and the laughing Buddha and then the you know, the silent Buddha and they all are saying something. Um Jesus came to die. You know, if, if you want to do the, the he's a teacher, yes indeed, and moral exemplar, yes indeed. But his purpose ultimately was to die, was to go to the limit of God forsakenness. And so that's kind of a Serious business, you know, right. somber. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I remember that years ago, Joseph Campbell, remember him? He's a precursor mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Peterson yep. in some ways. But he always loved, it's in, is it Luke? It's one of the synoptic gospels when, as before he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, they sing. Mm-hmm. So the Last Supper uh, closes and then they sing, which was the, the Jewish tradition, you know. And I remember Peter, or not Peterson, but um, uh, Campbell. Campbell saying, that's the way to go to meet your death. You go out singing, you mm-hmm. know? And so Jesus singing with his disciples, even as he's facing his own death, that's kind of a cool, you know, image. Totally. Yeah, definitely. What, what are the, the, the different arms of the word on fire? Now, is it, is it a, a company that's separate from the church? Is it? A, yeah. Okay. No, it's not officially linked to the church. I mean, it's, um, um, you know, Cardinal George and now Archbishop Gomez have, you know, I think smiled upon it and all that, but we're not officially like an arm of the church. We are 501c3, you know, so we're independent, mm. um, doing the work of the church, trying to serve the church, but we're not officially tied to the church. What are the different arms of it? I know you have a podcast, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. So all the different forms of outreach, we got that, but there's also now the Word on Fire Institute, which we founded. And that's, um, the purpose of the Institute is to form lay people as evangelizers. So Interesting. I'm trying to draw people, and we've drawn now a number of them, as as paying customers, you know, so they, they get access to specialized videos in theology, spirituality, evangelism, et cetera. We brought some wonderful teachers in. We've done, um, you know, we film them teaching, and we present these really cool courses. And so the Institute members, my hope is that they then invade their worlds as evangelizers. And my dream is that that continues to grow and then becomes a national force. Mm-hmm. So that's an important part of it now. Now, I, I you know, we I, we don't know. I haven't met the entire staff or whatnot, but I've met a few people that work with the Word on Fire, and it seems like everybody works out. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them do. Not everybody, to be fair. There are some, you know, who are <laughs> less less physically developed. But uh, no, it's just I don't know. Uh, I mean, Steve, these are, they're built like you, they're not just like guys that work out. They're they're more buff than we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, Father Steve, who's my kind of right-hand man and been working with me for years, has always been into, you know, fitness and, and bodybuilding. And then uh, Joe Glore, who met me my very first day in LA when I was announced as a bishop and he came up to me and I didn't know him from Adam. And uh, and then we kind of just gradually drew Joe into the work of Word on Fire. Now he's our producer. Mm. And he's been, you know, for years, a serious bodybuilder and is there a role of physical fitness in, yeah. in spirituality? Yes, and I, I would say that for sure. And not that we were planning it that way. Everyone's got to be, you know, sure. a, a buff um, model <laughs> to be part of We're on Fire. But yeah, New and standards. that circles back to our, our opening move in this conversation. But absolutely, I think, uh, you know, men sana and corpore sano is an old uh, principle, a healthy mind and a healthy body. And uh, especially if you're doing work of evangelization, I mean, you've got to be fit. I, I tell the priests here, you know, I, I run this pastoral region of Santa Barbara and got a, about a hundred and so priests that, that I'm concerned about. And yeah, their physical fitness is important. I always ask them, how are you exercising and what are you doing? And you seeing your doctor and how are you eating? Because it can happen to priests for all kinds of reasons. You get over busy or whatever, and you start going to McDonald's all the time. And, you know, so yeah, if you want to stay fit and do the work well, you've got to be in good shape. Mm. Yeah, there's this big, uh, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, there's this big uh, veganism push, but it's a very moral push as if uh, yeah. you know, eating animals is wrong and whatnot. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, though. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't push that far. Mm. How I mean, I, I respect people that have that conviction, but I wouldn't want to universalize that. Mm. So, but mistreating, of course, would be. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Well, I mean, again, great podcast every time. Good. Yeah. It should be yeah. every yeah. single pleasure. Yeah. It's all, it all I, I come out. with so many questions, but as you talk, I literally become dumbfounded and I can't remember <laughs> totally. half the things I want to ask you. And I think that's a you have that amazing quality. So well, good. I enjoyed very much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you very thank much. Thank you.